Welcome. So everyone could please take their seats. We're very excited to get our program started. I'm Joan Berman, the class of 74 and a parent of 2005 and 2011. Today's forum is entitled Tenure She Wrote Women in the Academy and it's sponsored by the Pembroke Center Associates, a group of alumni and friends who support the Pembroke Center and organize programs such as this one to connect alumni with the center's work. Founded in 1981, the Pembroke Center's research and teaching explore how gender and other issues of difference, such as race, ethnicity, class, and religion, affect our thinking and our world. The Pembroke Center archives preserve the history of Brown and Rhode Island women and the intellectual history of feminist scholars. Our panelists today are Sangeeta Bhatia, class of 1990, an MD-PhD biomedical engineer and professor from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Mary Renda, class of 81, PhD, professor of history, Mount Holyoke College. Judy Sims Knight, class of 1965, PhD, chancellor, professor of psychology, UMass Dartmouth, and honorary degree recipient, Louise Lamphere, PhD, Distinguished Professor of Anthropology Emerita, University of New Mexico. Our moderator is Nancy L. Buck of 1965, Trustee Emerita and longtime supporter of the Pembroke Center. In the interest of time, I encourage you to read more about these accomplished women in your program. And Nancy, thank you for leading our conversation today. Thank you, Joan. This program, of course, was generated by the exhibit that's on the first floor of Pembroke Hall, and if you haven't looked at the exhibit yet, please do. And the exhibit, in turn, was generated or made necessary, or whatever term you want to use, by the fact that one of our panelists, Louise Lamphere, was denied tenure in the anthropology department at Brown in 1974. After recovering from the shock, she filed a class action lawsuit, which was ultimately settled with a sweeping decree that has as I think the exhibit says, change the face of Brown. There's, there are pictures down there of 20, uh, 20 women who came to Brown during, during the decree period. There are many, many more since, of course. But it, it took a lawsuit to get us to this panel with respect to Brown. And what we have today are uh, panelists who um, most, well, three, all but Louise, went to Brown and are going to tell their story. Now let's start by what's tenure. The American Association of University Professors defines tenure as an arrangement whereby faculty members, after successful completion of a period of probationary service, can be dismissed only for adequate cause. Critics of the academy think that, you know, that's, that's the end of your career. Faculty will tell you that it's meant to be the beginning, the beginning of a secure period in their lives where they can do what they set out to do in the first place. So tenure for an academic is the holy grail, or the golden snitch, if you will. <laughs> and today we have four panelists who not only survived the tenure process, although one had to file a lawsuit to get there, but have flourished, as you'll hear. Not without ups and downs, but these have all flourished. I'm going to start by asking each panelist some questions. I, I hope and I know that what's going to happen is that they will find reason to comment on each other's answers and I, I may never get to ask another question until the end, which would be fine. Um, but the, the first question is, is for Judy, Knight, uh, Judy Sims Knight, and it's this question. Even before you get to coming up for tenure, you have to get yourself hired in a tenure track position. And we'd like you to tell us a bit about your experiences in, in that regard. Well, I got my doctorate from University of Minnesota and the Institute of Child Development, which is one, well, at the time was one of the best programs in the country. I also acquired a husband at that time, and he was offered a job at Brandeis. They also, the department, psychology department, wanted to hire me as well, but the president said no on the grounds of nepotism. My husband even went to his chairman and said, oh, so being married is a problem? Fine, we'll get divorced. <laughs> and the chairman goes, you'd get divorced? Well, would you still live with her? And he said, of course I'd live with her. I love the woman. <laughs> and the chairman was horrified, and that didn't work. And so I ended up at Wheaton College, which most of you know is a small liberal arts teaching school. So I, by that very action, 
my career path changed from one of a top level researcher to primarily teaching and doing research on the side. And at Wheaton, what happened? So at Wheaton, I was at Wheaton six years because I did want to live with a man. And I had a baby along the way. And I was denied tenure on the grounds that my research was collaborative. And I didn't do research by myself. A year or two before that, another psychology professor, a male, was tenured without any research. So I then went to UMass Dartmouth, where I have been ever since. And at, Dartmouth, at UMass Dartmouth, it went better? It went much better. <laughs> UMass Dartmouth had a very forward-thinking provost of the time. He was a man, but he was an arch feminist. And he worked very hard to make an egalitarian working environment for us all. <laughs> And should I give the percentage now? No. No. Like, it's OK. <laughs> all right. Thanks. And, and Mary Renda, um, the question I'd like to ask you, we'd all like to hope that women's colleges um, are better than other kinds of <laughs> institutions <laughs> with respect to their treatment of women. And in addition to talking about your own experiences, talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, I want to start by saying they are. <laughs> but, but, but. Uh, also, they're not. And uh, so I, uh, and I also want to back up just a little bit and say that I have been in an odd relation to my discipline, in part because I spent three years at the Pembroke Center uh, working with Joan Scott and Elizabeth Weed and thinking in some ways that were out of step at the time with my discipline. Uh, Joan Scott picked me up by the scruff of the neck and said, get to graduate school. I did. And at Yale, they told me that if I had a theoretical commitment to the sorts of ideas I had, that I would have a hard road to hoe there. And um, by the time I left there, what I came with was what everyone was trying to do. So that worked well for me. But I went off and eventually, after another couple of positions, landed at Mount Holyoke, where I did a kind of history that was political history, but it was also very informed by an emphasis on culture, some of the older men in the department didn't think it really counted as history. And this is a tricky thing, because who gets to define the discipline? The discipline was, in fact, moving with me. But these older men had a different idea about what history was. And they were working hard to make some trouble for me. I knew that as I approached the point of tenure, uh, having been taken aside by one of these older men and been told that I was out of step and I needed to move some things about the way I went about doing my work. My book at the time was finished, but it wasn't reviewed. Uh, it wasn't out in the world yet. And I just crossed my fingers and thought, well, I've got to see what, what's going to happen as we go forward. Uh, what happened was very lucky for me. The uh, fellow who had taken me aside, uh, who's a Pulitzer Prize winner and very prominent historian, just at the moment when my tenure case was about to begin, it, the story broke that he had lied about serving in Vietnam. <laughs> and he was taken off the case. And that was very lucky for me. I'm a very kind person, and, and I, I didn't want to gloat too much. But a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, called me and said, I know you won't gloat, but I'm really thrilled because you're going to get tenure now. <laughs> and, uh, and I did. So that, that worked out very well. And what year was that? That was in 2001. 2001. Mm -hmm. Sankey, I'll get to you in a minute, but I want to go over to Louise for a second and just and ask you and, 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 and Mary also to, to comment on the, the fact that it's 1981. Yeah. And we're still defining disciplines, and you use the word cultural. Do you mean now? N n well, no, then, when your tenure case. Yeah. 2001. 2001, yeah. I'm sorry. 2001, and, but yeah. And Louise was denied tenure essentially for that same reason. Years before, yeah, right. In 1974, I mean, would you have expected it was still going on in 2001? Well, I think one of the things that seems to be happening, uh, a couple of my feminist colleagues in anthropology have pointed the, to a number of cases of minority women. Uh, who've come up for tenure and been denied. And they didn't know much about these cases, but it's the same issue about marginalization. You know, black history doesn't count. Uh, you know, the kind of work you're doing in literature isn't, is marginal to the discipline. So I think this issue of marginality 
uh, is, is still a problematic, sometimes for white women and sometimes for my, uh, minority women. And when you look at problematic cases, it's sometimes like there's a split in the department. They're the people who hired the person that think they're great, and then there's this bunch of folks over here that were not so happy. And a lot of it depends upon the dynamics in the department about w cases that go awry, so to speak. Sankita, you're the, the youngest on this panel. And what we all want to know is when you, you, you were tenured at UCSD, University of California at San Diego, was it in the ordinary course, so to speak, or were the problems of earlier eras still weighing on the processes that applied to you? And do you think it's any different for women in the STEM fields? OK, those are yeah. two very, very different questions. Yes. So in terms of, so I'm an engineer, um, and we tend to be a lower fraction of the faculty overall. So um, at, at, in general, and when I joined the faculty at UCSD, I was one of two women out of a department of 20. Um, I was the second woman, and the um, only one who'd ever come up for tenure because the other woman was senior. And I was wanting to think about starting a family and very conscious about when I would plan my children relative to tenure. I was um, offered to go up early for tenure, which I think academically was not a good idea. Um, but I really wanted to have my kids on the other side of tenure. So I let them put me up early. It was a sort of a funny, um, funny decision. And, and because they were so supportive, actually, I, I got tenure very early and then had my kids on the other side. Um, so I actually feel like that I really benefited from all of the work you all did because um, they, they knew that they had to treat me well. I was, you know, essentially the only woman in the department, except for this one senior woman. I had like 15 dads. They were all looking out for me. And, um, and I said at the time something that I say to my younger colleagues, which is I thought this problem had gone away. And I remember when I was here at Brown that um, my best friend Teresa and I, who's in the audience, we were both engineers. We said freshman year, what is this thing about women in STEM? There's plenty of women in this engineering classroom. By the time we graduated, there was 7% of us left. So there was disproportionate attrition. Um, and when I got tenure, I was treated very well. So I thought, oh, what is this problem? I was treated very well. But now, if I look around, I have very few senior colleagues, very few women on the board of directors with me. So the problem has sort of shifted. Um, and my realization is that we're sort of not done. Um, but my tenure process actually was very smooth. We're very focused in this panel because it's the, it's the title on tenure. But do any of you want to talk also about, OK, you get tenure, and then what are we, how do women do in getting promoted to full professor? Is, is, does that then work fine? Or no? <laughs> <laughs> you just got it. <laughs> I'd love to take that up. Um, actually, this problem of uh, how the fields are defined and how that, that, that tra tracked me beyond that point. And at one point, um, I was very involved from the very beginning. I was always very involved, both as a historian and in women's studies and gender studies. Uh, but again, this was disturbing to some of the older men in the history department. And when it came time for me to chair a department, uh, I, I, the women's studies program was in need of a chair, as was the history department. And when I announced that I would be chairing women's studies rather than uh, rather than history, it, it got a very big reaction. In fact, so big a reaction that several things happened. Uh, one senior member of the department uh, said to me, if you want to have any future, if you think you're going to get promoted, you're going to need to let go of this feminist nonsense. And at one point when we changed the, the name of our program from Women's Studies to Gender Studies, he wrote me a note saying, I'm so glad you finally reckoned with what I said and are letting go of this feminist nonsense when I informed him that that was not the significance of the shift. Uh, I got more kickback from that. But it, it was clear to me, and not only at Mount Holyoke, actually, but talking with colleagues elsewhere, that the question of what you study, um, particularly I'm thinking of colleagues of mine who are themselves African-American women, and some who are not African-American, but who study the history of racism, there's a way that these topics were very disturbing to some of the older members of the departments. And this set of people who've done this work have had a, a hard road to hoe, in fact, uh, both with tenure and with uh, promotion. And it's not only about our being female, but the dynamics work out so that this is a large 
set of female faculty who were not promoted in the same, uh, on the same, uh, in the same way as men around them. I can't resist asking this question. There, there must be some men who study feminist theory and gender studies and so forth. What's, what are their career paths like? Are they spared what happens to the women who study those things? Or do the same things happen to them because of the subject matter? I am not aware of men in the same position as the large number of women I'm talking about. So perhaps there are, and I just don't know them as well. I can't give you a, a percentage or a, a statistical comparison. Uh, but anecdotally, I have not seen the, same, seen the same phenomenon with my male colleagues. There are anthropologists who are guys who study masculinity, however, which is sort of the compliment. That's, right. <laughs> and, uh, That's not marginal? No. I mean, <laughs> Matt Gutman, who is here, Brown, uh, has done very well you know, doing a book on masculinity. And it was a very, I, I would say it was a feminist book, because he, there's a lot of women in the book, and the importance of women and gender roles, and so on and so forth. And I, I consider it a feminist analysis of, of masculinity. And, you know, he got a job here, got tenure, has been, you know, in an administration and so forth. So I, I, I don't think the same thing that, you know, ha happens to men. I mean, there, I think Mary's right that there aren't very many men who study women's issue, but there, there, are, there are men that do masculinity, gender, and, and, and so forth. And Judy, what about in psychology? Are there, are there similar sub, subspecialties that distinguish the subject matter of the work, men and women? Yeah, um, men tend the, the harder areas, so perception, physiological, there mm. tend to be more men proportionately yeah. in those fields. And in the uh, developmental and social areas, there tend to be more women. Interestingly enough, in clinical psychology, although I think it's changing now, but traditionally there have been a pro proportionately more men. For somehow that doesn't have the same low status as developmental and social does. And how do those status things affect promotion and tenure? Or, or do they? Or does each take, kind of take care of its own? I would say each takes care of its own. You know, in, in, if, you, if you look at it through that lens, my guess would be that it sort of avoids the direct competition because the men are competing against themselves and the women are competing against themselves. Although I, think, I do think that's a gross overgeneralization. There are lots of exceptions in the details in individual cases. There is something in yeah, science please. that's happening, which is interesting, which is that the, um, the newer fields, so nanotechnology is a new field, synthetic biology are a new field, so these are things that emerge very rapidly, and lots of science is now big team science, very collaborative. Um, they're, it's starting to become clear that women are being excluded um, unconsciously, perhaps, from these, these large initiatives, and so you don't see them in the newer field. So if you look in nanotechnology, women are underrepresented. Even though it's a new discipline and there hasn't really been time to leave them out, um, they haven't been included as they're growing. Um, and oh. and, oh. and that's it's true for two or three of the really big, hot fields. Um, but environmental would be the exception, right? Exactly. That's true. And well, yeah, and there, I think there are no other theories about which ones are, where there's penetration and which ones there aren't, and what kinds of what are the social dynamics that lead to that? But are there parts of engineering that are still very masculine, like, I don't know, mechanical engineering or civil engineering? Uh, yeah, you know? most, most of them. Yeah, I can say engineering. But, um, but the, the um, biomedical and environmental um, yeah, and okay. chemical are better. Why? Um, so people have hypothesized that um, women tend to, um, they're more motivated by by a sense of service, and, um, and and actually many engineering programs have now tried to do sort of design-based learning um, or project-based learning, and in those in those programs you do actually see women coming into the field. Oh. So the idea that they're very motivated by um, disciplines where you the thing that you're making serves the human population, whereas um, historically mechanical engineering and electrical engineering, even though they actually do serve serve the public, they're sort of not advertised that way. Are those stereotypes true, or are they just they're why just, men think women yeah. go into? I think there are really no data on either side, <laughs> <laughs> except for that if you do project-based learning, you do see women come in. So, so that's the only data. 
And can we, go, can we go back to these emerging fields that have large labs and large collaborative projects, and putting aside the fact that the stereotype is that women are supposed to be more collaborative. Why is it that women are still excluded, and, and how are we going to fix that? You're the one who has to answer yeah. that question. <laughs> or, well, maybe others have answers, too. Go ahead. I don't want to derail that question, but actually, I wanted to pick up on this issue of service. Because I yeah, think that's yeah. another dimension. It doesn't only have to do with how, how fields are defined and who's in them, but also the kind of work that um, many women are doing yeah. while getting, in the process of getting tenure and right. also afterward. Yeah, right. There's an awful lot of uh, labor that goes so. in, in terms of teaching, in terms of service, particularly for women of color who are often tapped again and again and again right, for right. committees in order for those committees to be representative. Uh, so there's an enormous amount of work that women are also doing in addition to the scholarship that is uneven. And I think that's also an element of, of this. When I was in New Mexico uh, in the beginning, we used to have a women's group sort of helping each other sort of as a support network. And we were all having this problem about doing too much service. And by that time, of course, you had standards and criteria in every department. And you know, it was really clear service was 20%. Teaching was 40 Research was 40. So the issue was, don't spend 40% of your time you know, trying to do so. we kept coaching each other. Don't get on this committee. Don't do this. Don't do your, get your book done. Uh, because they're, first of all, women do a good job at that. And second of all, they get asked for it, especially minority women, as you were saying. So we were saying, do your service work afterwards. And I think savvy department chairs will not make the junior people who don't have tenure do a lot of service, like not be the graduate advisor or not be the head of this committee. Do something really simple like, you know, be on the committee where you're just a member and have to go once a month or something. So I, 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 I do think that service thing is a, is a big sinkhole in the tenure process. I want to follow up here, though, is the house uh, iconoclast. The idea in law, in a house iconoclast and non-academic, in law for years, women did family law. They didn't yeah. do family law because women like family law. They did family law because nobody would let them be a litigator. Yeah. And so yeah. I want to just ask the question, yeah. right. are we reflecting those same kinds of stereotypes in women do those things because they like to do service? Or do they do those things because it's harder to be a mechanical engineer when the world's against you? I, I just want to test some of, I, you're going to say there's no data, and that's okay, because I'm yeah. a lawyer, I don't need to have data. But, um, <laughs> I'm an engineer, so that's how I think. Right. <laughs> I mean, what, what do you think, and what, what do the rest of you think about that, you know, those kinds of career choices? Are they internal or external? Both. Well, I think there's a, I think there's a mix. I think that what you alluded to is a very real phenomenon, which is that um, they need, they aren't, Institutions are now aware that committee representation is important in faculty hiring, in faculty promotion, because of all the work that you all have done. And so, so there needs to be a woman, a, at least a woman, on every committee. And I have an MD-PhD, and I'm an engineer, and I'm in two departments, and so I am often that woman that's tapped for all those things. And it's very hard to say no to the five bosses that I have. Um, and I personally have that thing where I want to be likable, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to always yeah, figure out which no to say. Um, so there's that. There's the piece where the institution is putting that on you, but then there's also the true, a true service piece where I feel, you know, obligated to pay forward what was done for me, and so I have a steady stream of women at the institute coming to me for career advice, and that's kind of invisible service, yeah. right? So nobody's going to count that in my 20%, and it's something that I do because yeah, I, I want right, to share right. my time, but it's, you, know, you have to protect yourself and not be broken by it because you still need to do your scholarship. So I think there is a piece that's also not institutional. And when you're being, and you're being asked to be on all those committees and you're not being asked to join the collaborative who's going to write a grant that's going to be, you know, get multi-millions for the institution, right. it's really, it's hard and I think yeah. it's hard for women and many men as well to sort of say, hey, you left me out of this grant thing, I really would be good at this, why aren't you including me? So it really is very hard to do that, and it's very easy to accept all of these flattering requests to be on committees. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to ask you all a question that, now, now jump backwards again. What, why did you choose to be an academic? And when you, did, when you made those, that choice or those choices, yeah. it's probably more than one choice, 
did you know that the path was going to be rocky for all these reasons? Or did you just, or? Why did you choose to, to well, be an academic? When I was in sixth grade and we had to say what we were going to do, I was going to be a housewife. Uh, and we did a little act, and the guy who was the son of the milkman was the person who delivered me milk. And, you know, I gave that up pretty soon because I, ha I hated housework. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the difference between going to Stanford, where my BA was, I was still in this sort of thing about, you know, smart women are not so terrific. You know, you can't get dates and et cetera, et cetera. But when I got to Harvard, I thought, oh my god, you know, it's not so bad here, you know. People are really interested in intellectual things. So I think one of the things about academics was it validated, you know, my, my abilities to, you know, think and do and write and so on and so forth in ways in which, you know, my undergraduate and my, certainly my high school experience didn't, didn't uh, validate. So I, I chose academics partly because, uh, you know, it was very fulfilling in that, in, in that did way. You, did you have mentors? <laughs> Colleagues at Stanford and at Harvard who encouraged well, you? Yeah, with the, I mean there are a lot of male or dis and any who yeah, discouraged but you. The, the 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 role models for women were very few and far between. At Harvard, the only woman full professor was Cora Dubois in anthropology, and she had a woman's a chair for a woman. And there's now a lovely biography that one of her uh, students and a colleague of mine just finished. And she was a lonely person. But she, she was incredible. I mean, she was really tough. And she was hard. To, her demands were incredible. She gave me a B. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but they, we just needed more of that around. The, the other women who were role models were you know, lecturers and uh, research professors and you know, not on tenure track full professor uh, positions. So uh, I mean, in the end, it turns out academia is a great profession because, first of all, you've got summers. And it's easy to have kids compared to being in law school or med school or something like that, you know, where you have to work like 80 hours of work no matter what. Uh, so there are ways in which academia is a much more flexible uh, job than, than, than many in the country. So I think that's another thing. But I didn't discover that until way late. <laughs> Judy, what, what impelled you to be an academic? And did you, did you have mentors? Did you have, and, and of course, since we're all from Brown, Especially yeah. I never had any mentors, but I had a, a, a life-changing experience at Brown. When I declared my psych major, I went, dutifully went to see the academic advisor, who was a psychologist, and I wanted to be a marriage counselor at that time because when I was younger, I had friends whose parents were just <coughs> needed counseling. <laughs> so I thought that would be great. Um, and I went to him, and he told me I had to have a PhD to be a marriage counselor. And I said, well, if I'm going to have to have a PhD, I want to do research and do something really useful. So then the second thing that happened in that little um, 20 minutes was he said, well, he was married to a woman who was getting her PhD, that she had worked him through um, his PhD, and now he was working through hers. And he was the first man I had ever met who loved a woman of intellect. And I had not thought that was possible. And I did not want to give up, I did not want to give up marriage and children, you know, for anything. So there, in 20 minutes, I discovered I could have it all. And so I went and I did it. <laughs> that was good. And I didn't worry about any of these things. I was totally unaware of feminism. I mean, it, it, it didn't really exist until after 1965, guys. Um, uh, and so uh, yeah, yeah. no one was telling me I ought to be worried about these things. So I didn't worry about them. I found them out as I went along. <laughs> and I found out the thing about it is convenient to have an academic career when you um, have children, because if the kid gets sick, you actually can leave work and take care of the child. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, but I still treasure my job. I mean, what job? could you have that's better when you learn something new every day? I want, go, go ahead. Well, I, I, I was reflecting on the, my first two years at Brown, actually. I came wanting to be a lawyer to, to, to change the world and, yeah. and, and, and uh, you know, get, some, get some justice. And I, and I went into a <laughs> class with, uh, on law, and uh, the professor called on individuals, maybe some of you took this class, 
called on you by name uh, and a uh, chart. And uh, yeah. what I found was that when he called on the men in the class, he asked them interesting, challenging intellectual questions. And when he called on the women, he tended to ask questions about fact. And that was part of an experience that turned me away from what I was interested in. And I found in the history department in American studies here a place where I could really think about the world and think about change. And I didn't even aspire to, to graduate school. But as I said, I had uh, Joan Scott saying, go, go, go. You know. <laughs> so I had a very particular picture of what was possible after my, by the time I left here working uh, with the Pembroke Center, uh, six years mm -hmm. at the Sarah Doyle Center and the Pembroke Center. I had a particular idea about what academia was. And in a way, I could only have been disappointed because it was a, a remarkable place. I went off and I was surprised by the extent to which I would bump up against uh, people yeah. who had a different idea about, as I said earlier, towing disciplinary boundaries. On the other hand, no regrets. Where could I have done the things I've done? Where could I have thought about and written about the range of things that I've written and engaged in the kinds of social justice projects that I've engaged in that I, uh, other than academia? So no regrets. And in fact, tenure is such an important institution, as messed up as it can be, it has meant that I could pursue the ideas that I wanted to pursue, even though I had colleagues saying, you won't get anywhere if you do, and I thought that's OK. I've got tenure, and I can now think and write and do what I want to do. And that's been extremely valuable. I did eventually get promoted, too. But yeah. Thank you. How about you? Well, I, I wanted to reflect back on this idea of role models. Um, because in STEM, it's still the case that girls are opting out of um, math and engineering, you know, starting at age 11. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, and, and at least some of it has to do with what we were sort of talking about, which is seeing somebody who has a life that you want. Um, and it's not just the academic life, not just the intellectual life, but, but seems to have a family if you want a family, and seems to be happy and not lonely and have yeah. colleagues that they enjoy. And so, you know, I yeah. think there is this, um, in spite of the fact that, you know, at, at MIT we have quite a number of women faculty, you know, I, I think that my, my undergraduate students don't, don't want a lot of their lives. They seem like they're working very hard and they don't have the, a full life that they, they would enjoy. And so I try to, to, um, to share what an amazing, you know, it's just amazing. You have no, it's your job is to think. <laughs> for, yeah. for a living, and you know, I get to invent things, and I work with talented students, and I have no boss, and I can, I can do it all. I can start companies, and teach, and travel, and and it's totally flexible, and I can raise my kids and be married to a scientist, and so I try very hard to, um, yeah. to share that because I think that people are looking up the pipeline and making the decision, you know, kind of in middle school, like, oh, I want to be Beyonce, <laughs> like, yeah. maybe you want to be this other person. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. I mean, I'm just fascinated with all the, the all the, um, from the BDA to the New York Times, everybody's talking about work-life balance in academia as well yeah. as yeah. in, yeah. when I take you off, make the evil law firm. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm fascinated to hear you say, well, this is a life where there's plenty of time. Is that, was that really true? You, you guys don't work 80 hours a week? No, no. Yeah, no, no one said that. We, yeah, we said it was flexible. Not that there was a lot of time. Well, let, <laughs> but you right. can't work at midnight at home in your computer. Exactly. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. The flexibility. Yeah, there's, the, the, it, there is never enough time. Never enough time. Okay. Just one. <laughs> oh, I want to I wanna also go back to, to another uh, aspect of what you all have been talking about. Everybody mentioned that they had, that no one had female role models, apparently, um, except for, for Mary. Um, did you have male role models? Did, were there some men who, who helped you? I mean, Louise, we know because you've told us repeatedly that you got your job here in right. the first place because some male professor at Harvard said you were the one for Brown, essentially, something like that. Well, also, I, a, a graduate student at uh, Harvard came here to Brown, Carl Heider, and he was the one that let me know there was a job. That was in the days when you know, there weren't job advertisements. You had to do it through personal networks. And 
be on the Harvard list, which I wasn't, I don't even know if I was on it, because it was secret. Uh, but I, you know, my professors did write me good letters, because I've seen them now. Uh, and you know, I think one of them, you know, Bodhi said at the bottom of it something like, you know, she's a little worried because she's a woman that she might not get hired or something like that. So I mean, people were sensitive about it. But I, I think by that time in the social sciences, at least in anthropology, there were lots of women graduate students. And we may not have had many role models, but there was a batch of us. And there were, there were wives of, uh, you know, women who may not have been on the tenure track, but uh, certainly provided you know possibilities, and you could see married couples. I mean, you know, I, it, at Stanford I had a couple, uh, you know, married couples. The women weren't in tenure track positions, but they were they were academic couples, and you could sort of <laughs> see that that was a possibility. I mean, if you're going to join the old boys network, you got to find some male role models. Did you yeah. have some? I so as I, well, or were there women? Yeah, there weren't any women. There's still not very right. many women. Right. Um, but and. Actually, there are not many men who fit the criteria I described earlier, which is a life that I want. Um, uh, but I had three amazing mentors. Um, and they were all men. And they all saw more for me than I saw for myself at that career stage. So the first one was my dad, who told me I should be an engineer. The second one was a physician here at Brown. Um, he was, I was working with him in a lab, Moses Goddard. And he said to me, why are you not getting your PhD? Why are you not thinking about that? Um, and I had explained to him that I had this life plan that I made with my dad, and that wasn't in the life plan. He said, well, if you want to work in biology and biotech, like, you need more training. And then the third one was my PhD mentor, who said, you should be a professor. Um, to which, at the time, I said, I'm not sure I want your life. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, just go interview he said, Here, for a good experience. Um, and then I found out on the other side, as you did, that it was um, you know, wonderful. All right, I want to put, it, put up some slides to show you where we were and where we are statistically. The first one is for Brown. And this is the slide that's in the exhibit down on the first floor. And it starts on the left, of course. Um, but it doesn't, have, uh, it doesn't go back as far as 1965. It starts in the year that Louise was denied tenure. There are a lot of people here from my class class of 65, and if there were, I was trying to think about it this morning, how many women there were with tenure at Brown. One was Dean Rosemary Perel, who had tenure in the psychology department, although I know that they didn't get around to making her a full professor until many years later. Mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth LeDuc, also in the biology department, mm -hmm. and not many more. If there were five, I'd be amazed. Uh, but Barbara Bar was she it, no, as yeah, early Barbara as that? Yeah. OK, good. And she got stolen away from Harvard, so she didn't last too long here as a role, mo role model. Can anybody think of any other tenured yeah. women in 55? Right, we just, Barbara Lewalski. Yeah. Yes, right. Okay. right. That's right. <laughs> and the woman who oh, ran geez, the okay. Anne Mary Brown Library, they've given tenure to at some point, I think. So in 74, you can see. Still, hardly any. The big red line is tenured and tenured track. And for 2012-2013, we're up to, uh, for associate professors who have tenure, so close to 40. But the full professors are still below that. OK. But I mean, at least you like the trajectory. For MIT, we don't have exactly the same slide because they, they get, didn't get sued, so they didn't have an exhibit. But <laughs> they, the two oh, lines bad. that start roughly in 1991 and go to 2011 are the science and engineering faculty, which is the, the yellow line, and the all faculty, which is uh, all the faculty in MIT. We don't know how many of those have tenure. But you can see from those trajectories, and you can probably guess that the, the rest of the internal trajectories are about the same. Um, and they're in the same, roughly, the, they're below Brown in terms of total faculty, so the number of tenured faculty can't be as high either. But we're well below you know, 30% for the tenured people at MIT. At Holyoke, what kinds of numbers do you have of any kind? I, I, we put you to shame. Uh, we really do. Um, we've got 50% tenure and tenure track faculty wow. are women. 
actually almost 51 percent, uh, 73 percent untenured, tenure track faculty are women. Wow. Uh, the only measure uh, where we have uh, fewer women is in full professors, and there it's 46 percent. So, so that same yeah, pattern. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, it, full professors aren't yet. Right, right. And there are a few things that contribute to that. Uh, it, it's significant, but it, no, very, very good. Yeah. And at UMass Dartmouth? UMass Dartmouth doesn't keep really good statistics on this. Uh, I think that's we illegal. Finally, we look down, we, we ask uh, institutional research, we ask human resources. We finally got one number from the um, affirmative action folks. 47% yeah. are women, but that includes benefited part-timers and full-timers. We couldn't get any tenure track. We couldn't get oh, tenured. Yeah. We couldn't get full. Um, my impression, though, is that it's changing. Well, I'm, this is egocentric impression. It's changing very rapidly. Last year, four men retired from the psychology department, and we went from 40% women to 58% women <laughs> in one year. And as so UMass Dartmouth had was created a, by combining two technical institutes. So um, there, as these retirements um, occur, I think the percentages are going to yeah. percentages of tenure track and, and full professors will be yeah. going up towards equality. I want to leave room for questions and answers. I have one well, let last. Me just, let me just do wait, New Mexico, wait. OK? I just want to do the figures on New Mexico. Oh, yes, please. Uh, Sorry. Because I, I did, I only found 10-year-old statistics, but it's, it's, it's more like yours. It's 46.5% women. But that does count everybody. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is that friends of mine in the history department, uh, one of whom has an administrative position, just did a satisfaction of life kind of, or, you know, a whole big questionnaire. They only got 400 people to answer it, but that's a lot. Um, given that you know, usually 25% of a population will answer a long survey. And they found high satisfaction rates across the board. Uh, so it, you know, I, do, I, I certainly think that the private elite universities can get from 30 to 45 in the next whatever years if they try, because that's where a lot of the public universities are. Um, and, and, and women's colleges. And women's colleges seems to me the big turnaround must be, must have looked real different in the 50s. Mm -hmm. That right. they were you know, yeah. lots of men, men presidents, blah, blah, blah. And, yeah. and the ones that have remained yeah. women's colleges are now turning into this. From the 30s to the 60s, there was a, a rough period at yeah. the women's mm -hmm. colleges. Uh, and maybe even a bit later than that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a very different picture. In the 70s, when you asked the faculty at Brown why they didn't have more women. Yeah. Part of the answer and part of the defense to, to Louise's case yeah, right, was right. that there weren't any. Or as they always put it, we don't know any. Mm -hmm. It's not the same thing as there weren't any. <laughs> <laughs> Are the pools of women in most disciplines now large enough to, to get us to 50-50 or yes. even beyond? No, no. Not in STEM fields. Does it depend? Well, obviously it depends on the discipline, but how, how close are we? Yeah, so in, in, um, in engineering, the, what we call the pool yeah. are typically the postdocs. The, so you do a PhD, then you do a postdoc, and then you would go tenure track. And the pool in engineering is about 25%. Um, and so uh, what's interesting about that is we, we tell the, the hiring committees that you should be interviewing at pool because if it may be that people aren't applying, it doesn't mean that they're not there. You just don't know them. Right, so you need to go out and proactively recruit. Um, and I think the interesting about, so we, we definitely, if, if unsupervised, I've done this experiment in my department, if unsupervised, we actually don't even interview at pool. Um, and, and there is a lot of unconscious bias that comes into the process because we do what are called best athlete searches. I don't know if this is what you call your searches, but basically the best, the most talented candidate across all disciplines. So whatever they were doing, they were the best at that. And when you ask you know, a committee, does this person look like a star? Is this the best athlete? And they're across area. There's no objective metrics. This is exactly when unconscious bias comes in. 
So we're interviewing below pool because the applicants are under pool, and then we, because we have this sort of unconscious bias of the best athletes, and we're interviewing under pool. So in my department, um, last, last cycle, we interviewed one, one out of 12. Um, and then, so I went to my department chair, and I said, hey, guess what? Like, you know, we have a problem. And he said, can you please start the, the diversity committee? <laughs> and will you be the chair? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and, and this year, we did better. So. But so the, I think the message is that the work really isn't done. We have to keep, you really have to be vigilant to make sure that the institutional yeah. changes actually feed all the way through to the intent. That's right, yeah. And all, all of you have served on the hiring committees and on the tenure committees. Your experience is like Sangita, or different, worse, better? Uh, m much better in, in my case. Um, because it's history? Yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's an ample pool. There's a great deal of respect yeah. for for women scholarship and for women as historians, um, notwithstanding the things I said earlier, I think that we see the difficulties once women are in the departments and dealing with the day-to-day -day dynamics with men in those departments. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the hiring, hiring looks much stronger. I will say Mount Holyoke is especially known for and very strong in the sciences. And we, we are not at parity in the sciences in terms of male-female. Yeah. Yeah. But we've got better numbers, I think, than we've seen here. How about you, Julie? You, I think there's still some subtle bias that goes on. This is what you call the unconscious bias, and that um, men tend, the men in my department, tend to be very impressed by credentials, and the women tend to be very impressed by um, depth of reasoning, and so we sometimes have disagreements because of that. But we talk it out. And if it comes out, somebody notices it, then we can go on to the next plane and, and we get past it. So when the, while it's still there, it's sort of like a knee-jerk reaction. And, and at least in my department, we, can, we do get beyond it. Could I come back and add, I think uh, we have to break this out as well in terms of experience across race, because yeah, right. I think Absolutely. the situation is yeah. very, very different for white women in That's academia. Right. Yep. Very different. And mm -hmm. I think that um, African American women in particular, perhaps, but other women of color as well, are up against a different set of challenges around the expectation of what kind of woman you need to be in order to be acceptable, in order to be respected, and so the numbers are very, very different. The percentages are very, very different when we start looking there. And I, I think we need to, to look at that because that is, uh, it's the combination of racism and sexism together mm -hmm. that operate to exclude uh, women of color from positions that they should rightly be the best athlete for, recognized as the best athlete. And as I was preparing for this, I was thinking of the numbers of African American women historians who have changed the field, who have won multiple awards, yeah, who have right, yeah. shaped the conversation. But they were denied tenure. They had to keep fighting, go to some other institution, and yeah, eventually right. get tenure. Yeah, yeah. When I look at the list now, I can barely believe these women were not tenured. But they weren't white women. It's a very different set of challenges. Yeah, I want to kind of echo that, because New Mexico is a my majority minority institution. And it's you know research one institution. And, we still don't have enough Hispanic faculty because uh, most of our, a lot of our students are Hispanic. Uh, we have a large number of Native Americans. And in our department, we had better representation. And then, you know, as retirements happened, we replaced them with, you know, with, in some cases, women, but we still are not up to where we were with minorities, which wasn't a lot. It was like four or five people, but in a department of, of, of 20 or 25. So I think. One of the things that happens is, is that, you know, as people retire, it isn't just, you know, when the Hispanic person retires, then you've got you to, like, work on keeping your department just as diverse as it was. And I don't think we've done a, a very good job in our department. And anthropology is a field, uh, you know, it's become a, a, a women's field. I mean, it's way over 50% women. And archaeology, which was kind of the, you know, the man's preserve, is even becoming, you know, there are lots of reasonably prominent women archaeologists. Uh, but I think this issue about minority women is, is, is really incredible. And I would throw in uh, uh, lesbian uh, gay faculty as well. 
uh, because I just think that's another issue. I, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, when we wanted to hire women's studies uh, uh, chair who worked on sexuality was uh, a lesbian, we had, I had a tough time getting our department to even consider somebody, because they said, well, if we really wanted somebody that did sexuality, we should have advertised it for it. But I think it's becoming better on that front, too, but not, not nearly as good as it should. Let's, uh, let's turn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the question I said I was going to ask you at the end, because I think we've, we've answered it. Good. You've answered Fine. it. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Yeah. I'm sure there are. a question, they could come up to the you microphone. Can come over to the, to the microphone, just so that here, I'll, I'll bring you the, how about if I bring her the mic and other people can come up? Is this on? Hi. Thank you all very much for the work you've done and for doing this panel, all five of you. Um, my question, you brought up the un unconscious bias, and that is what I see in my work with faculty now. Overt racism, overt sexism is shocking, gets shut down very quickly. Yeah. I see a lot of very subtle bias in student evaluations, in how faculty talk to one another. What are the tools to help fight that very subtle, very unconscious bias that is preventing people from getting where they need to be, particularly men of color, as well as women of color and women and other marginalized groups? That's a very good question. <laughs> I'm, I, I feel so disheartened because even just recently, you know, more of these cases where you can see this unconscious bias working, uh, producing tenure denials that I think as soon as these books win their prizes, which they will, you know, uh, then it'll be shown up. But in the process, it's not there. One of the things that I appreciate about what Mount Holyoke is doing, even though it means that we're relying too heavily on a very small number of women of color faculty to do the work, is that the institution is figuring out how to follow the lead of that group of women, and, and also some of us who are not women of color, who are saying we need to pay close attention to this, and we need to be in conversation across the faculty all year long in ways that will address it. So, for example, they began to give out copies of the book, um, I think it's called Blinked, um, mm -hmm. yeah. a book about unconscious bias, uh, raising questions at faculty meeting and faculty retreats, uh, and, and engaging department chairs in a much more extended process of preparation for searches so that we're not saying, oh, well, we've got to check off these affirmative action boxes. We're really engaged in a much more thoroughgoing process of asking how might unconscious bias operate in our hiring process and in our tenuring process. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're seeing results from that work. Uh, so it, it takes a lot of work and a recognition that it's necessary to take on the issue. Uh, because for many years, the, we, it would come up in a smaller way, and uh, often faculty want to say, oh, don't anyone tell us what we, we know what we need uh, to, to, to know about our field, and these people are interfering. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they were able to deflect yeah. it for a long time, but no longer, because the institutional commitment is there yeah. to yeah. really yeah. doing this in a thorough way. Tell them about the IAT, the Implicit Associations Test? Yes. Uh, the, the part of this research uh, has looked at uh, the associations that, uh, right. that subjects in these studies make between, for example, um, certain kinds of emotions, negative emotions, and, uh, and black faces. And, or, and what, what's right. the association? And there are ways of setting it up so that you can actually see when you look at a white face, do you tend to think positive thoughts or do you tend to think negative thoughts? Now, they, uh, there are a lot of different tests. One of the things that Mount Holyoke has done, it has made these tests available and all faculty are supposed to spend time. When we're going to be on a hiring committee, we have to commit to spending a certain amount of time actually doing these tests online we don't share that information with anyone, but then we have to get an, a chance to look at it and say, well, isn't that interesting? The, the way that my responses line up with racism, even though I feel that I'm a person who's not racist at all, 
or the way that yeah. my yeah. Uh, responses line up with a certain set of ideas about what women ought to do as parents and professionals and how they ought to handle that, notwithstanding the fact that I'm a parent and a mother and a woman, and I may still engage in some of those uh, automatic responses. So it's been very helpful to have that. And one thing I think that's very interesting about um, unconscious bias training, which we also do, but not as extensively, and I'd love to come <laughs> get your, um, get your, your work. Um, is that uh, we have to remind them every year. It's sort of this really, I, I think of it like CPR training, like even though they really need a refresher, like you think you know, but you actually need to be reminded. And so even if you've sat on the committee every year for 10 years, you know, we retrain them. Um, and you know, your biases shift and, and, and people forget. You know, it really needs active attention. I think the administrators are very important yeah, in this right, process. Absolutely. We currently have the dean, our dean of our college is a feminist lesbian woman. And every search committee is required to discuss what they did in their search process to address those implicit biases. So we're already, I mean, for years, we. Any searches have to go out to minority publications and, oh, yeah. and places yeah, like that. So that's so that that's our pool part. includes them. But then within that pool, if a department excludes all you know disproportionately women and minorities, there's our dean going what? And she has a pro a policy. If you hire a minority that money comes out of a different pool than your line, so you get to hire another one. So she puts rewards yeah, right, yeah, in yeah. place for addressing your unconscious biases and dealing with them. Yeah. It's also possible to have target of opportunity hires. That's what's, uh, yeah, that's exactly important. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's totally important. It works I think there's a, a question in the yeah. back. So I'm curious. I know there's a huge rise in adjunct Professors oh, yes. who do Good. not are not on tenure track, et yes. cetera. And my, I, I have no idea what that is here at Brown, but just nationwide, that's a huge yes. thing that's happening. Yes. And I assume that means there's far fewer tenure or even non-tenure right. track positions. So I'm curious what, how that influences people right now. I, I'm particularly concerned because I have a close relative who yes. just graduated with her PhD. She looked headed to academia and she said, look, what are the chances? And she just took a job with an oceanography, science, you would think top university going into consulting. You know? No, you're absolutely right. That's, that's the number one problem because yeah. I, I just looked at an AAUP report like on the, online yesterday and it's something like the decline in full-time te uh, tenured uh, positions has, has gone from like, you know, almost 40% uh, uh, down to 24%. And the rise in the part-timers has gone way, way up. And that affects women, because women end up doing these part-time things. And you cannot put a life together by going 50 miles from three, to three different campuses uh, teaching these courses for somewhere between $2,000 and $4,000 a course. You can't pay your rent on that. Um, well, and it's a it's a long time structural phenomenon. At the time that Louise brought her, brought her case, and the case yeah. was about the was largely about the tenure and tenure track faculty. Right. Brown, like every place else, had some lecturers and some research people, yeah. and those were usually female, um, typically because the university wouldn't offer them tenure track jobs, and so. And we don't have those reflected in this in this chart, but they take my word for it. They were mostly. Female. But Nancy, what's and the what's same is the same phenomenon is happening with the adjuncts. Is who, yeah. who gets to be a tenure track That's person right. and who gets to be an adjunct? But it's, being a full time lecturer gives you a salary of forty or fifty thousand dollars. I understand that. But if you're teaching, you know, four courses uh, for. Four thousand dollars. It's not going to add up to that salary. I'm dealing with the sexism issue, not the labor relations issue. But you're right. Yeah, but <laughs> I know. Right. I know. I think the gender. Th that's what's. But the thing is, is that that's what's happening that, uh, to undergraduate uh, undergraduates at well, community colleges, like, at, at four-year right, colleges. Let's do that, and, so and then we'll come over here to the to the left. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Sarah Wald, and I'm at the Harvard Kennedy School. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Sarah. Um, 
And uh, just two things. One of my colleagues, Iris Bonet, who's a uh, behavioral economist, has done research on gender equity nudges. And what she has found is that employers who, when they are picking one candidate, their implicit biases come in. And it's always, even if they want to bring women, the, the man is more qualified. But when you cluster the hiring, it's much, much harder to do that. So actually, we've started where we can on faculty search is clustering. So you hire two or three at the same time, and it's, it seems to do that. Um, the other thing that we have done some of is it is very hard. I really admire those schools who tackle the implicit bias straight on with their faculty hiring, and I think that's, yeah. that is the way to do it. One of the other things we've done, though, is bring in people who study implicit biases in other contexts. So particularly this year, we had um, people who study criminal justice and right. gave yeah. lectures on implicit biases that have been shown in police forces. And yeah. anyone can easily make the jump to, oh, yes, I see that face and feel the same thing. And so that seems to be helpful, too. Not that it's a complete solution, but at Brown, we're, we're also doing much more of the cluster hiring or, or trying to make sure that we interview four women in the pool, not just one, so that the one doesn't have to compete against all the men like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. it, does, it does help. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, um, I just don't see the, the, uh, the bulk of, of uh, higher education having tenure systems in the next seven or eight years. I see um, it's part of the adjunct issue, but it's part of, I think, um, universities becoming more run like business. Yeah, we see this really. at Brown. We have a wonderful president, um, but she really has a new edge on things, and she wants profit centers here. They may not use the word, but they, they really want them. They want MAs for profit. They want other issues for profit. And so you can, you can see edging towards changes in models. So how do we, it, do we apply any of these lessons that we've learned now to a different world and um, what do we do about the huge level of unemployed PhDs? So we have wonderful, talented, totally tenurable uh, products in our program. And we're still sending them and preparing them to be professors. And that's what they love. And we want them to do it. But should we be thinking about different ways of training our students so that they're in a world where if there's no tenure, they have many other options. Let me, let me respond to that in, with a couple of observations. First, um, at least at Brown, uh, the president was asked just Thursday whether this was by somebody who hoped that Brown might get rid of tenure. And she said, that's not happening. So at least at Brown, we're OK. <laughs> uh, the second thing would be to say that it wouldn't be the first time that just as women arrive at a door, yes. that the door closes for other reasons having nothing to do with them. Yeah, right. And the third thing to say is those are really good questions, but there's no way we're going to get to them today. We've dealt with the, the tenure and the, the careers of these panelists. Thank you so much, and thank you all. Yeah, yeah.